The Churches of Christ present Let the Bible Speak with Evangelist Shaw Hay Jurgen. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to this edition of Let the Bible Speak. My name is Shaw Hay Jurgen, and on behalf of this program, I welcome you this morning. For those of you who may not be familiar with this broadcast, Let the Bible Speak stands for exactly what our name describes. We endeavor to look through the pages of God's holy book for truth and guidance. In a world that's filled with questions, we recognize that God provides answers and insights. One of the most majestic scenes in the life of Christ was his triumphal entry into Jerusalem during the week leading up to the Passover. All four gospel writers record this event, but we'll begin with Luke's account in Luke 19 and verse 36. And as Jesus went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. What is the significance of this procession? Why spend time considering this kingly parade? We'll talk about that when we return after this song. As a nation, Americans love parades. On Thanksgiving and New Year's Day, millions tune on, turn on the television and tune into these events. Uh, folks line the streets and even brave the freezing temperatures just to get a glimpse of the procession. Parades are held to congratulate Super Bowl or World Series teams in their home cities and to celebrate other victories and honor returning war veterans. There's an old story about an elderly missionary returning to the United States to retire. He and his wife had spent over 40 years preaching in Africa, but now he was alone. His wife and two children had all found their final resting place in the soil of foreign countries. As he got off the plane, he saw a great crowd of people waiting at the gate. Some were holding signs, others were waving banners, and he could even hear sounds of music above the shouting voices. For a few seconds, he thought, can it be? After more than 40 years, all these people have actually come out to welcome me home? But no, that was not the case. See, on his plane was a politician returning from a short visit to Africa. During his visit, the politician had been catered to and waited upon and all his needs had been met. And now he was being welcomed back with a ceremony his nation could provide. As the old missionary waited and waited in the airport, the contrast was almost more than he could bear. For a moment, he began feeling sorry for himself, and he started to pray, Father, uh, Father, why? I've, I've served you faithfully for so long, yet look, 
I don't expect much, but is it wrong to desire that there be some sort of welcome home? After those words left him, he immediately remembered what Jesus said. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. See, down here, God's people rarely get the recognition they deserve. Men and women who dedicate their lives to the Lord are often forgotten. It was no different for Jesus. Early in his ministry, there were times when large crowds followed him and hung on every word he uttered. But those days were long gone by the time of the final week leading up to Calvary. In fact, just a few months ago, before this fateful Passover week, Jesus had to escape the city of Jerusalem in peril. John tells us in John 10, beginning in verse 22, now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear me witness. Then the same chapter, verses 30 and 31. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Verse 40, and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Beyond the Jordan meant into the uh, district known as Perea, east of the Jordan, away from Jerusalem. The only exception to this avoidance of Judea happened in John chapter 11, when Jesus did something that brought him a great deal of attention. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And it was this miracle, performed just about one month before his final week on earth, that caused a great multitude of people to seek Jesus out when they came to town for the Passover, John 12, 9 through 11. The large crowd of Jews then learned that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Five days before Jesus would go to Calvary, he proceeded into the city of Jerusalem. As other sojourners arrived and heard about Lazarus and Jesus, the miracle worker, they had to see these men with their own eyes. All of this leads to what is often called the triumphal entry, a kingly parade. In this procession, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ began to come to their final climax. After a few days of teaching to the masses in the temple, followed by some private instructions to his disciples, Jesus would eat the Passover, institute the Lord's Supper, go to the Garden of Gethsemane, be betrayed, arrested, mocked, beaten, and crucified. But before any of that can happen, he must first go to Jerusalem. And in this parade, notice first of all this morning that there is power portrayed. Look at Luke 19, beginning in verse 28. When Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he came near to Bethpage and Bethany uh, at the place, uh, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where you will enter and you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he has said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. Now remember that Jesus has not been in this area for months some allege that Jesus simply prearranged the events recorded here and had a man prepared to give the disciples this cult, but that seems pretty unlikely. Jesus has been traveling with a fairly large entourage for weeks, uh, making their way slowly towards the holy city. Rather, Jesus here displays his power and omniscience, knowing exactly where the cult could be found and exactly what to say to secure it. 
Notice that Jesus said that this was a colt which had never been ridden. Now this may seem like an odd detail to include, just as when Luke said that the tomb Jesus was buried in had never been used before, Luke 23, 53. These statements are not just tidbits of useless information. They speak of the fact that this cult and that tomb were fit for someone special, someone important. Consider Numbers 19, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eleazar the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him." Concerning the sacrifice of this red cow, this red heifer, and other animals used for sacred tasks, the requirement was that they had never been yoked or never worked before. And that was a requirement that was placed on them as a prerequisite for their use. Here, this cult Jesus speaks of is tasked with the responsibility of carrying the most sacred object the world had ever known into the holy city for sacrifice. So Jesus' power and wonder as Messiah is thus glorified. But notice also that Matthew says the cult would be with its mother, and the disciples should bring both of them. This is according to Matthew's account in Matthew 21, verse 2. Now, why need both animals here? You know, some artists have rendered this scene with Jesus standing one foot on each animal, waving his arms into the air, but that's not correct at all. There may be a much better reason for why both animals were brought and it brings us to our second point, and that is that in this parade, there was prophecy perfected. Let's look way back at Genesis 49, 10 and 11. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now there's little room for doubt concerning this statement from Jacob that God had declared the line of Judah to bring the Messiah into the world. The Christ would be a ruler and a lawgiver. Verse 10 gives reference to Shiloh, which most believe to be messianic in its connotation. The verse here uh, is speaking of the, uh, Jesus and his uh, work as Messiah, but what is verse 11 about? Uh, the immediate fulfillment of this refers to the nation of Judah, and how they would have great abundance and prosperity. But since verse 11 is connected to verse 10, which is highly messianic, there could also be reference of this procession of the triumphal entry. Both a donkey and its colt are referred to. The donkey is bound to the vine and its colt to the choice vine. Just a few days after this event, Jesus, in comforting his disciples about his impending departure, would say, I am the true vine, John 51. So perhaps these two animals are tied together, and Jesus to the choice vine as he's riding the colt. Uh, uh, Jesus, rather, and the choice vine tied together. It's also hard to read the statement in Genesis 49, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes and not think of the blood-stained crucifixion. Genesis 49 represents just one prophecy fulfilled and perfected during this parade, but Matthew gives us another one in Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5, when the Bible says, All this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This prophecy comes from the pen of Zechariah, in Zechariah 9, the prophet decides, uh, uh, dedicates rather eight verses to predict impending destruction. He looks into the future and he sees war and strife. He sees catastrophe and ruin. It's bleak, it's dismal, it's depressing. How could anyone find anything to be happy about under such conditions? Apparently, Zechariah could because he said in Zechariah 9 and verse 9, Rejoice greatly. 
O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Do not despair, O Israel, but rejoice. Shout, children of Jerusalem. Why? Because your king is on his way. Oh, good. Well, that's great. Praise be the Lord. A mighty deliverer will come to our rescue. After years of war and oppression, God will send a conqueror. Wait, that's not what it says, is it? No, this king, the one Zechariah spoke of, comes with justice, salvation, and in meekness. It was not David the warrior they should be expecting. It was Solomon the wise, the peacemaker, who himself rode to Jerusalem on a colt. The contrast between the war horse and the donkey is profound and shows what kind of Messiah Jesus was. And it seems the crowd knew what was going on, which demonstrated in the next point, that is, that there were praises proclaimed. Let's look at Mark's account now, Mark 11, verses 7 through 10. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it, and many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Putting their garments on the colt was a sign of kingly respect for the Lord. John states they cut down palm branches for this royal welcome, like what is recorded in Revelation 7, 9 and 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb laying down their garments, cutting down these palm branches. And then if we put all the gospel records together, their cry is, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And these are quotations from Psalm 118, which is one of the Hallel Psalms that the Israelites sang as they ascended into Jerusalem for Passover. The psalm in question reads in verses 22 through 29, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. He will re we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray. Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have uh, blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horn of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. This psalm is highly messianic and various parts of it are quoted multiple times by various New Testament authors, attributing all these things to Jesus. The phrase, the word Hosanna, comes from a phrase in verse 25 that means, save now, I pray. So the meaning of this Passover psalm is to stir the hearts of Israel in remembrance of the salvation God brought upon them in Egypt. And at the Red Sea, the psalm calls upon God to save again again to bless the people and to accept their sacrifice. All of this was worked by Jesus. He was the sacrifice which was bound to the altar. He was given as light to the world. He is the chief cornerstone the builders rejected. He brings the day of the Lord and supplies the world with salvation. Blessed is Christ who comes in the name of the Lord. These people were proclaiming the rightful praises to the true king and redeemer of Israel. If only they would have overcome the opposition and maintained this glorification, if only all of Israel gave this adoration to Christ, then Israel would have come to Christ the way they should have. Unfortunately, this was not the case. And for the last point I want you to consider with me this morning, we also see that there were plots planned. Plots were planned. Look at Luke 19, 39 and 40, and then verse 47. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. 
And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. The Pharisees, irate in the fact that the people extolled such praise to this lowly son of a carpenter from Nazareth, demanded that Jesus silence these blasphemers. Jesus gives perhaps one of the most unusual replies to any of the Pharisees' demands in scriptures when he said, if the people stopped singing, the stones would take their place. And there's kind of a double meaning here. Number one, nothing can stop the true king of Israel from taking his throne and being lifted up as Messiah. And number two, why are you Pharisees less intelligent than stones? Uh, why don't you see the truth of what's happening when even the stones do? Even the stones understand it. And you boys, as we might say, are dumber than a box of rocks. Well, the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. Or as Mark words it, and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. See, it was about power and prestige for these men. Either Jesus would become so popular as a rabbi that the people would go to him for counsel and ignore them, or Jesus would incite a rebellion against Rome and the Romans would remove the Sanhedrins from power. Either way, Jesus was bad news for the leadership of Israel. In just a few days, with the help of one of the Lord's own apostles, their plots would be accomplished. They would gather a large mob of armed men, march to Gethsemane, arrest him, torture him, and crucify him. Jesus portrayed great power in the triumphal entry, especially as he perfected vivid Old Testament prophecy. Because of this, the people proclaimed high praise to the king, but the leadership reacted quite differently, plotting and planning to put the Prince of Peace to death. This parade for Jesus illustrates the vast contrast of his entire life and ministry. At times, he's seen as a mighty miracle worker, calming tempests and raising the dead. At other times, he extols the virtues of lowliness and humility, living a life of poverty and homelessness. To some, he was the greatest teacher who ever lived, and much more. He was the Son of God, the Christ. And to others, he was a worthless instigator who knew how to stir up trouble. And today, folks are presented through the holy record of the gospel with that same man. And today, folks have to make up their mind about how they will respond to Jesus. You have to decide whether you will praise him or persecute him, whether you will trust him or throw him away, whether you will give your life to him or go on lost without him. Let's have another song.
If you have any questions or comments about our study, if you'd like to begin a Bible correspondence course, if you desire a written copy of the sermon, or if you have any other spiritual need, please write us at the Rice Road Church of Christ, 4710 Rice Road, Columbia, Missouri, 65202. We'd love for you to join us for worship this morning. We meet at 10 o'clock, again this afternoon at 2, and at 7.30 each Wednesday evening. You can contact us by phone at 573-474-9975 or visit us at our website, riceroadchurch.com. And there we've posted some past episodes of this program. If you live in the Jefferson City area, the Capital City Church of Christ invites you to join them for worship today as well. They're located at 920 Leslie Boulevard in Jeff City. They meet this morning at 1030, this afternoon at 230, and at 7 o'clock each Wednesday evening. I'd also like to invite you to view a website that I'm involved with. It's christianlandmark.com. And here you'll find a host of articles, audio, and video sermons, and other wonderful material to aid you in your continued study of God's Word. We invite you to tune in next week as we'll continue to let the Bible speak. I thank you for your kind listening this morning. You've welcomed us into your home, and we've studied God's Word together. Always remember the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God bless.